Okay, we're going to go ahead and begin. Thank you everybody so much for being here. Uh, my name is Maureen Ryan. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies here at UW-Milwaukee, here at UW-Milwaukee. Um, thank you for joining us. This talk today is called A is for Asylum Seeker, How to Talk About Migration in Troubled Times. And with us is Rachel Ida Buff, um, history professor at UWM, and Alejandra Oliva, the translator of the book. So Rachel and Alejandra are going to be in conversation together. Um, and just a few notes before I turn it over to um, Richard Grusin, who's the director of C21, um, who will then turn it over to Alejandra and Rachel. You are all muted in terms of your sound. And I do that so that, you know, if you take a sip of water, or, you know, rustle around, it doesn't move the camera to you, so to speak. Um, it doesn't matter to us one way or the other necessarily. If you would like to keep your video cam on, that's completely fine. Sometimes it's nice to know that people's faces are out there. Um, we will be doing Q&A using the um, chat function. So if you hover over the screen down at the very bottom in the gray bar, you'll see chat. You can throw a question or a comment in there at any point that you'd like. They'll be recorded in the chat log. And I think we'll go to um, audience questions after about a 30, maybe 40 minute chat uh, between Alejandra and Rachel. And I'll moderate the questions from the chat. So that's how it works. Feel free to leave comments, questions, um, chat to others. You can actually chat to different participants in the list. If you see somebody you know, you can have private conversations in there. Um, I will mute myself so that my email noise uh, stops dinging at you in just a moment. Um, I think that should cover everything, but if you have a question also just about how, it's, how the event is working, you can also leave those questions in the chat and I will answer them. And I'll jump back on to moderate questions in a little while. So again, thanks for joining us. Um, welcome everybody. Am I unmuted? I'm good. Um, welcome to uh, C21 and uh, our second summer event. And uh, it's really a pleasure here to, well, first, before I say it's a pleasure, let me say that we're all still, I think, adjusting to the new uh, media in which we're dealing uh, these days. And so uh, I hope things work smoothly for everybody. Uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to have my colleague, friend, and comrade, Rachel Buff, with us today. Uh, Rachel was a fellow at the center two years ago when this project um, began, although perhaps it was brewing uh, even before she became a fellow but she can tell us more about that. But I remember very distinctly um, the day she presented it to the fellow seminar and the enthusiasm was um, unmistakable. Uh, people really encouraged her uh, to go ahead with this not traditional academic project and really encouraged her as well to uh, follow that non-traditional academic voice. It's a voice that Rachel the academic voice is a voice that Rachel is expert at, but she is also expert at writing for more popular audiences, both um, fiction and uh, more op-eds and other kinds of popular uh, journalist pieces. Uh, so anyway, it was, um, I'm really excited that the, when the project came up and really excited now that it's out uh, as a book and I'm really looking for looking forward to the conversation today. Uh, I also wanted to briefly introduce Alejandro Oliva, who I've only just met, who is a translator and essayist and embroiderer. And in looking at her webpage, well, first I turned to the um, embroidery and the knitting, which uh, was fascinating and uh, has, I think, some interesting affinities with the act of translation, with it, which I'd be interested in uh, thinking, in hearing her think about that with us a little bit. But I was especially touched looking at the website to see her essay on uh, translating Annie Dillard into uh, Christian Latin, medieval Christian Latin. Um, Annie Dillard is one of my 
absolute favorite writers. Uh, very careful with her language. And uh, as somebody who studied Latin in high school, not medieval Latin, um, I can't even begin to imagine uh, what it would take to translate Dillard uh, into Latin, but I have a little sense of it from reading that piece. In any event, um, I'm really happy that they're both with us today and that uh, you're all with us too from wherever you may be. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn the floor over to, I guess, Rachel, you're going first. Yeah, um, thanks Richard and thanks Maureen and thank you to everybody for coming in this strange new world of not really going anywhere but going somewhere all the time. Um, thanks for taking the time. I know that for myself, I often sign up for these things and then when it comes to four o'clock on Thursday afternoon, I'm like, that is just not happening. I gotta not sit here in front of my screen anymore. So thank you for persisting. So Alejandra and I talked yesterday about what we were going to talk about and we decided it would be a good thing to tell you the story of how we met and let that lead us into um, the broader conversation about how we came to work together and what the book is about. And so I was reflecting on that. We met in the winter of 2019. We both were um, participants in the New Sanctuary Coalition's 40 Days and 40 Nights of Action at the U.S.-Mexico border in San Diego, Tijuana. Um, and my friend Libby Garland and I had rented an Airbnb in Chula Vista, which is sort of south of San Diego, pretty close to the border. And that Airbnb became kind of a center for a lot of mostly women who had volunteered for the, um, the work at the border. We would come back at night and drink wine and eat takeout and talk about the day. I had insisted, I recall, that we get a place with a hot tub. I don't remember why, but that was, if you know me, that you can imagine why. It, just anyway, so we would get in the hot tub and talk about things. And um, so Alejandra was one of the people who, who came over. You were staying near us, I think, at a hotel in Chula Vista. Yeah, I was staying really nearby. So it was an easy walk from the Airbnb to my where I was staying. And I think... Alejandro, you can talk about this too, but I think that the heaviness of the work sometimes requires the comradeship and the wine in the evening. I know that I'm right now working still with Al Otro Lado, which we'll talk about um, doing remote work, um, putting together people's legal files for their asylum hearings. And um, I find it transformative and intense work. And I, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it needs a, it needs something else at the end of it, you know, at the end of a few hours of it. So I recently had cause to read um, something that Libby has been working on, um, our friend who we met through. Um, she's been writing about kind of what we can see as the beginning of the refu re refugee regime that in many ways is being uh, terminated now by the action of governments like ours, though not ours alone. And she's writing about the post-World War II period and specifically the role of refugee aid workers and refugees in constructing a map of this refugee regime. And she argues that through their work and through their desires, they have agency in trying to make meaning of things like countries of resettlement and refugee rights and all of these broader questions, which of course are ultimately decided by, you know, non-governmental organizations like, like the United Nations, by various host countries that do and don't decide to take people in as um, we're seeing. But um, the assertion of meanings and this map in the face of what I call in the book, the demeaning of very important words about refuge is kind of a continuity. Um, and it links how Alejandro and I came to meet with the work we subsequently did together. And I became really aware, and I think, you know, I was really drawn to go to the border as were a lot of people that we knew at the time because um, of the sort of spectacle of people needing asylum and refuge being treated as if they were criminals for needing that. Um, and what we're seeing now, I think, is the collapse of those words, the collapse of 
the term refugee, which comes into being in the post-World War II um, regime as a juridical term, a legal term that carries some weight. If you can argue that you're a refugee and not just a migrant, then you get special treatment. Now, of course, that's tricky, right? Because a refugee is special and two people leaving for the same reasons might have access to different kinds of pieces of paper and one person is a refugee um, and one person is seen as just, just coming in the Hong Kong refugee crisis that happened after World War II through the revolution in the People's Republic, what's now the People's Republic, aid workers tried to make a distinction between refugees and rice refugees, right? So refugees were coming because they hated communism, whereas rice refugees were just coming because they were hungry. Whereas we know, right, because we're human. I always quote the Somali British poet, Warsan Sherry, who says, you don't put your kid in a leaky boat unless the boat is safer than the land, right? No one leaves home. I always say to my students, no one says after brunch, hey, how about we flee? Okay, right? It's not like that. It's, it's a, ve a vexed and wrenching decision. But the words that govern them, a refugee or a migrant, desirable or undesirable, documented or undocumented, is sort of what really struck me um, at the border because those words and those papers are so important. Um, I have more academic -y, historical -y things to say about that, but maybe we'll get to that presently. I guess I want to say a little bit about the book and then I have a couple of questions for Alejandra. That my very first chair, um, when I was an assistant professor, you know, had me in his office and he said, um, you know, he was very, gonna give me some good advice. He was a very well-intentioned guy and he said, uh, now your first book, I was trying to revise my dissertation at the time, your first book is, you know, just get it done quickly. Your second book is where you make your mark and your third book is where you say something really important. It probably gave me like decades of writer's block. Um, and this is my third book. And I guess his words though, not how he intended them are, I, I think this is the book that I finally got to say what I meant. Um, after years of training myself to write academic prose, nothing wrong with that. Um, but I wanted, I've always wanted to speak in a different voice, in a voice that, you know, I tell people I was speaking to the Osher Center, which is mostly senior learning yesterday. And um, I was saying, you know, you can actually read my book. My mother, who's here with us, often has bought my academic books. And then when I visit her, I notice that the spine hasn't been cracked. Like she's read the acknowledgements. And then she, very intentionally, there's usually a bookmark on page 50. Like she really tried, but you know, it's awful. Let's face it. But this is a book that I think my mom read the whole thing, right? This is a book you can read. So I guess like the words of my first chair are coming true and I'm, I'm very happy about that. This is the mark I wanted to make. So um, Alejandra, to turn to you and we talked about sharing our stories a little. I guess I have questions, but maybe you wanna introduce like the work we were doing and then we can go back and forth a little. Sure, that sounds okay. great. Let me turn it over so, to you now. Hmm? Let me turn it over to you for a while. Oh, thank you. Um, so I met Rachel in Tijuana and it was just incredible to watch her work. I was there, um, I had gotten a grant from my graduate program to be there. And so I was very much there to translate and to see what I could see and to be able to talk to people. I was one of the few people in the program who, or, who were there with New Sanctuary who could speak Spanish fluently. And so that was, like a definite role that I had day to day, which was just like making sure people knew what was going on and, and just giving out basic information all day. Um, and in seeing Rachel and Libby and some of these other people who were there at the border who maybe didn't have like that ease with language, but were still just like so plainly like radiating the fact that they were there to help and to be helpful was such an interesting experience for me to see people who were just like there to do the work and were able to do that even with like enormous language barriers in the way. That was an incredible experience. And then when Rachel came to me later and asked me to collaborate with her on this project to make this bilingual edition, it was really interesting to see the ways that like the experiences that we had in common of standing at a chaparral and watching people's numbers get called and of watching people as they're going onto the vans and not knowing what's on the other side or what's gonna be happening and trying to make these last minute phone calls uh, 
seeing that reflected in her pages and in her work was incredibly interesting. And then um, a little bit after that, I, a little bit after Tijuana, I graduated and now I'm actually the communications coordinator at the National Immigrant Justice Center. And so as I was reading and translating Rachel's book, I was also like being bombarded day to day with like the policy changes that were happening and all of these different things that were going on on a day. Like one of the things that I do for my job every morning is go through every major news site and copy and paste all of the articles that have anything to do with immigration. So like I was getting both this like up to the minute, very like rapid fire vision of what the immigration system was today, as well as Rachel's really deep considered historical view that was also like tying it into things like indigenous displacement, things like slavery that I knew about but had not ever connected to the what was going on kind of flashing by me on my computer screen every morning. And so the experience of reading and translating the book um, at the same time that I was sort of getting this like education in what the immigration system is like today was an incredibly powerful um, experience and Rachel's work still like informs the work that I do every day and like when I'm writing press releases when I'm interviewing people it has made it so much easier to draw these continuous lines throughout history especially now is like even my workplace is thinking more about like violence against black people and the ways that policing has impacted communities it's been Rachel's book has been such a valuable tool in doing that work and being able to talk to people about it and say there are these continuous lines, these are the ways in which our incredibly violent past is linked to our incredibly violent future. Present, hopefully not future. Thanks for those thoughts. Um, I, it occurs to me that we maybe want to back up a little and talk about the work at Alo Trolado. I subsequently went back and my friend Jim McKeever, who I met in Tijuana, two Junes ago now is here. So we wound up, though we went, you were working at the time with the New Sanctuary Coalition of New York, right? You had been working with them translating? Alejandra? Yeah, yeah, I had been, uh, before I went to grad school and I was living in New York, I had done a fair amount of translating for their Pro Se Asylum Clinic, which is just interviewing people and helping them fill out asylum applications and like getting their their individual stories down on paper in a way that the government can like read and recognize, which is in itself incredibly violent. Right. So even though we went to work with the New Sanctuary Coalition, we also did some work with Alo Cholado, which as Alejandro was saying, is a border rights, in Tijuana, it's a border rights organization. It has offices in San Diego and LA that do other things. And every morning they um, send people down to El Chaparral, which is the crossing where people are assembled both those who've been called to cross and those who are hoping they'll cross. So it's kind of like a really anxiety ridden airport where everyone brings all their luggage and their kids, only a very few people and sometimes nobody is gonna to get to cross. Um, for a while there was a guy that Jim was friendly with, the person that Jim was friendly with at Alicia Ladder that would go down with a big bucket of oatmeal and just hand out free oatmeal, which was such a, I mean, I like oatmeal, but it was also like so humanizing because people are at this terrible place where they're about to encounter the full force of both the Mexican and United States kind of military police apparatus. So anyway, the Alatrolado folks, we go down there and hand out literature saying, you know, we're, there's a free legal clinic and there's free food just a couple blocks away at, at Alatrolado and the clinic opens at noon and people come in um, to get legal counsel. They don't get lawyers, they get talked to by lawyers, but they put together their own asylum packets, which is an intense thing. I think we've been on different ends of that, Alejandra. I mean, I'm working with them now and I'm really struck by the incredible amount of work it is, just for me with a PhD, like figuring out those 300 page things. You know, and so many of the people who are, are charged with assembling all of the documents of their family and an account that's going to convince somebody that they deserve asylum and I just got finished with a fairly traumatizing file where there were four young men who'd been murdered and pictures of them in their caskets like you know it's an intense it's an intense business um, but I think the work gives us some deep insights into people's power and process and needs um, 
So I want to loop back to something you were saying about the deeper historical context, because while I wanted to write a book that people could actually read, I've always wanted to do that. Um, I also really wanted to make some long, long-term historical arguments in this book, because it's true that if you think about the migrants at the border now, now they're a multinational cohort, which really surprised me. And I remember, Jim, you and I Googling, like, what the heck is going on in Cameroon? Why are all these Cameroonians in Tijuana? Like, I hadn't done the reading. I, had, I was texting my Africanist colleagues, like, what's up? And they were like, we don't know, you know, like, but there's a ton of Cameroonians in Tijuana. Who knew? Um, but particularly with the Central Americans who make up the bulk of the majority of folks at the border, you can draw a straight line from wars over the, the land in New England in the 17th century and the dispossession of indigenous inhabitants to the reasons people from Honduras are in Tijuana and in Brownsville, Matamoros and in cities across the border. It's the exact same thing. You know, people aren't wearing funny hats and buckled shoes. We're talking multinational corporations who are after the water and the resources, but it's the same process of dispossession. And those folks then, the ones who survive those wars in this country are then criminalized as vagrants. So the prison industrial complex early on in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, most of who fills the early jails are men and particularly women accused of the crime of vagrancy. So there's this kind of really interesting process of dispossession. You take people's lands, you push them off their lands, and then you accuse them of not having any land. And that's why, that, that's the basis of the carceral state right there. So that's my like big historical point kind of, or one of them in this book. And I want to ask you Alejandra, because we kind of asked you to do something funky, which is to take a very US centered account and translate it into Spanish for a presumptively Latin American readership. There's other, there's parts of the book that are about other parts of the world, but mostly it's a US North American centered book. And I wanted to ask you if there are places where that was dissonant or where the, the words of the translation worked, but the meaning didn't or like struggles that you had. We haven't talked about this. We were so worried about the logistics of getting the book out that we haven't talked about like, is this, are we, you know, how do you do this? How did, how did yeah. you do that? I actually didn't envision necessarily the audience being a, Latin American, I, when I kind of, as I was translating my audience that I had in mind were Spanish speaking residents of like the United States, whether or not they came from Latin America originally or what their like linguistic situation was like that is who I was translating for. Um, but I think that there were moments of maybe not dissonance, but like difficulty translating. White supremacist is a term that exists, but is maybe not like widely used or isn't like, I feel like when we say it in English, it's like all one word, almost like the white supremacist. And like, we know what that means. And we have like specific cultural associations with it. And that isn't necessarily the same in Latin America or doesn't exist in the same way. And so there were some terms or some ideas that I was having to sort of circle around to get to. And that's not to say that white supremacy doesn't exist in Latin America. It's just not talked about in the same ways or not uh, not thought about in similar manners. And so there were some things that I found myself sort of circum circumlocuting as I was translating. Um, but yeah, I think those were those were some of the bigger moments. And and I was just aware as I was doing it that it was likely in Spanish that I was maybe speaking to people who had experienced different parts of this. Like that's the same thing is obviously true in English. Cameroonian immigrants for one are English and French speaking, I believe, but um, that there was a possibility that someone who was reading this book in Spanish had lived through some of the things being described in the book. And for that reason, it felt important to just really be careful in in the words that I was using and in the ways that I was was choosing to talk about these things and and choosing the words that I was using. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for the correction. Of course, Latin American and Latinx, US Latinx 
I wondered if there were places, particularly with the material on indigenous folks that, you know, felt, I know that in Mexico, sometimes the terms and the thinking about indigenous people is really different than in a U.S. context and the claims to sovereignty are different or did that feel different or strained at all? I actually don't know very much about indigenous like the state of the indigenous movement in Mexico or um, a lot of Latin America. I know that there is though a very similar history of dispossession, of genocide, of all of these things that we are seeing that are in our history or also in, in histories kind of across Latin America writ large. And so while I was translating like the specific story of, uh, the Mashpee people and the people in um and the Cherokee like there wasn't anything there that I don't think that someone who was Garifuna or Mixte or anything would not read and say yes this is also part of my story. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit too about you know when we were talking on the phone you were talking about the interviews you're doing where you're talking to people who did get asylum right, about how they, how things would be now? Yeah, so um, something that has happened in a big way in the last few months is all of these federal rules are coming through the register to be commented on from the Trump administration, but they're, every immigration attorney I know is freaking out. It's, uh, you can no longer apply for asylum if you are LGBTQ, like that doesn't count anymore. If you are uh, the subject of gang violence, like that isn't necessarily a, an asylum claim anymore. And so part of my job has been helping our policy team to respond to these new rules and kind of putting our organizational commentary out. And so I've been interviewing queer people and being like, what would have happened if you couldn't have gotten asylum because you were persecuted in your home country because you were queer like what would your life look like now what does it mean to you to have asylum now what does your life look like now and being able to it's a huge honor every day to be able to talk to people who have been through this and who are willing to share their stories with me but then also um like for every one person that i talk to there are dozens of people stuck on the other side of the border there are people who are still trying to make their way somewhere safe and who those doors are closing day by day because as you mentioned rachel the like globally the asylum system is is just really being undermined in dozens of countries um and so i think that that's been both a really interesting view at like individuals who this system has been able to help despite all odds and also just uh, a reminder of the scale of of what we stand to lose if we are constantly undermining the system in this way. Yeah I think that that's been a really I would say intelligent but I think it's just the force of sheer evil and brutality to watch that really problematic refugee regime that gets implemented in 1951. Like, it's not perfect. I can document the ways in which once the U.S. accepts, yes, there should be the special category as refugee, they automatically use it for this anti-communist white supremacist agenda. Like, these people are good. These people are bad. That's never good, right? You've been to grade school. That doesn't work out for anyone. But watching that be destroyed in doing the work that I'm doing now with Alatolado, which my husband is always really amused because I'm not a very detail-oriented person, but it's incredibly detail-oriented. I'm basically doing what a paralegal would do. Um, and so I'll be in my office for two or three hours, like wrestling with, you know, really stupid technical stuff that has to be done right for a file. And I'll come down and be like, these people are just not going to get asylum. There's just no way. The, the, the numbers are terrible. And like, so these, these human stories are, are going by you. And you're like, you know, the odds are like, 97 to 3 against them like this is just not going to happen I, it, when you were talking about the queer migrations i was thinking about i think it was i don't know if you remember there was one day we were in tijuana together and it was raining and there was that one family it was two women it was a gay couple and their kids and somehow my spanish wasn't good enough at the time and possibly now to know exactly what you all did but you somehow convinced the border agents to let them go through as a family and we weren't clear if that was going to stick more than 
like when they got to San Diego, would they would they be taken in together? Would the children be separated anyway? Would the would the you know? But that's impossible now, is what you're telling me. Even that sort of like weird cobbled together thing that whatever we did to get them. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's not that queer people aren't being led across. I mean, no one's being led across right at this moment. Like the borders effectively closed due to the pandemic and bogus public health reasons. But it's more that if you come here and in your asylum claim, you say, I need asylum because I have suffered from terrible homophobic violence in my home country. They'll say, mm, sorry, it's not because of like your political beliefs or anything. When in fact, being a queer person who believes that you should have a full, free, and like vibrant expression of that queerness is incredibly political and incredibly radical and deserves protection. Um, but yeah, it's been really surprising, or not surprising, terrifying and sad to just kind of see even this like messed up system that we have just being chopped up and sold off for parts basically. Yeah, I always say when, you know, tell students like, you know, it's not perfect and all sorts of bad stuff happens, but if you go back and read, and I always have students do this, read the UNHCR documents from 1951, they're kind of lovely. Like everyone should have the right to documents. Everyone should have the right to education while being transient. Education, yeah. work, food, always documents. So like basically the UNHCR says you should not not have documents. There's no such thing as being undocumented, right? Under that very aspirational, still kind of messed up regime. But it's like, it's this lovely idea that is so, you know, it, it's almost as if, you know, our our government the government of australia you know this is this is happening around all of the receiving countries are going through this weird paroxysm of you know like trying to litigate their way out of rescuing boats of people drowning in the mediterranean you know and trying to put people who try and rescue people sea captains heroic sea captains who rescue people at sea trying to persecute them you know that's that's where we're at and I, I just wanted to add um, one little story about language, because this book is really crucially concerned with language. It is really basically a glossary. Um, so my colleague, Margot Anderson, the distinguished historian of the census, brought this to my attention that right now the administration is trying to argue that um, we shouldn't count undocumented people in the census because that's not what the Constitution meant. And this is patently wrong like you know Margot and I and a bunch of other historians had a, actually a fairly fun time digging through the historical record because nowhere does it say only count the citizens because that's not the majority of who was here when they wrote the constitution right they're even counting three-fifths of enslaved people they're counting you know they're the only people who they're not counting is quote Indians not taxed which means they were counting everybody else and very few people were citizens few people could vote etc there were more foreign-born people than native born people when the constitution is passed, et cetera. But this notion of inhabitants is what they're floating. And there's a, one of the terms in the book is denizen, the idea that you live somewhere, you belong there effectively, you don't necessarily have full rights. And it's very clear in the constitution, it's very clear in the 14th amendment that those people do have some access to rights. And it's very clear that they should be counted. And the idea of not counting them is, is so, it's wild and the same, some of the same people in Congress who are arguing for that are the same people saying that Kamala, Kamala Harris is not born here and can't be vice president and all. You know, it's, it's the same old, same old. So um, I think that an attention to language is, is called for here in many ways. Going back to the glossary structure of the book, I'd love to ask why that was the, that was kind of the, the thing that floated up as far as why you chose to structure it in that way? I think when we were, so that was my first time at the border when I met you. And um, it seemed so precarious what you would be called, right? You know, you're lucky to be called an asylum seeker or a refugee and not an undocumented criminal, bad hombre, all those other words. Like it does seem like the words are so important and once you know like that was it's hard to remember this bad time given the bad time we're in now but that was the time of the family separation crisis which incidentally is still going on but hard to remember you know 
it's only because of those words, bad hombre, criminal alien, hordes, you know, like I, I was really struck by the caravans, which when I speak, I talk about, hey, um, the caravans are things maybe we could learn from, mutual aid, holding each other's hands, crossing a river, skills we're all gonna need, right? Waters are rising. But instead they're portrayed as villains and that enables Jefferson Beauregard Sessions zero tolerance policy. Like you have zero tolerance policy for terrible people. And I think uh, this is something that Libby and I have been slightly obsessed with. If you watch The Handmaid's Tale, there's this kind of fantasy that if America gets really bad, the Canadians are just gonna open their doors and love us. And that doesn't happen to anyone ever in the world anywhere. We all have this fantasy that if things get really bad, someone else, somewhere else will take us in. But that hangs on this word, refugee. And that is, you know, so I, I guess I got really fixated on, I mean, I'm a person who likes words to begin with, but I got really fixated on the difference between words and how, and I, I think that people who are not thinking about these issues all the time, I think we think that, that refugee is, is obvious and that when things are really bad for you, there will be somebody else who can welcome you. That if you, know, if you are really persecuted because of you know, race or sexuality or politics, or you know, the, 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 the gang piece is just unbelievable what people suffer at the hands of gangs, which you know, really are the outcome of decades of US foreign, foreign and trade policy. But you know, these murderous, terrifying gangs can literally kill your children and there's nobody who's gonna take you in and say that's wrong, we'll take care of you because of a word. So I got pretty fixated on that. And then, you know, one thing led to another and um, I started thinking about, you know, should there be 27 or 30, you know, it, it, like I also, Richard Morrison, who was my editor, started, gave me the word abecedary which is like a poem organized in the alphabet. And like, that was pretty formally compelling as a formal, former poet. He also gave me the word recto verso, which is how the book appears with um, English and Spanish on facing page translation. So these formal issues I also found really compelling. And it was a way to write something, I think of this book like a cookbook. You know, you, like, you don't read a cookbook start to finish. You kind of dig around in it and try and find stuff that's useful to you. And so a glossary seemed really like, oh, you know, it'll be something people can carry in their back pockets if they need it. That was my idea. Well, should we go to questions from people in the audience, if you're ready, we can do that. Okay, we have one from Madalena so far. Please feel free to ask something if you have, if you're a little shy, now's the time. Uh, I have like 10 questions, but I can hold back. And we'll start with Madalena's. She says, many more people are already becoming displaced because of climate change impacts. Can you speak to the terminology that is used to describe people who are on the move because of climate change? Is climate refugees um, an appropriate term, considering that many of the people displaced within the, many of the people displaced are within the borders of their own country? Yeah, that's a really important question. Thank you. I mean, there is an entry for climate refugee in the book, but it starts out with um, Barbara Bush calling Katrina refugee, Katrina, people who had to leave New Orleans because of Katrina, refugees. And this connotation that when they were living in the dome in Houston, they were somehow these like wild, exotic, difficult beings, right? Which does convey a sense of exoticism and foreignness and otherness. Like this isn't their country, they don't belong here. And we saw such appalling things during Katrina, right? Like, you know, counties that organized against people needing refuge. Um, at the same time, I think it's really important that we signal the effects of climate because it, it contributes to internal displacements as well as people needing to cross borders. So I understand your point that it is, it, it is a bit of a vexed term, but I also think it's important because I think a lot of the people in the caravans, a lot of the people coming from Central America now, part of the reason they have to leave it has to do with changes in the climate, crop failures, um, you know, losses, land loss. Um, and again, part of that is, you know, climate change is man-made ultimately, but part of it is short term man made in that, you know, we're going to divert this river to make this dam to power this, this, you know, to, to give us electric power. So 
Yeah, I think it is a complicated term, but I do use it in the book. There is an entry in cl on climate refugees. Can I, I'm gonna ask one of my questions then. Um, no, I'm not, Carolyn Eichner has a question. I will save mine. She asks, this is a wonderful, what well, she says first, this is a wonderful project, Rachel. Can you talk a bit more about some of the other terms in the book and how you chose them? That's actually really good. We should talk about that. So it was really important to me, for example, to have F is for fugitive, because as Alejandra pointed out, fugitive and the fugitive slave laws link questions of displacement and vagrancy from slavery to the present. And so that's the historical link. And you can say like, you know, that's the kind of thing historians like to do. Only if you think about the fugitive slave laws and the vulnerability of freed people, even those who made it to the North, it's a lot like the situation of undocumented people today. Like our documented students who are able to be on campus and work jobs and not be afraid of getting busted for a speeding ticket and winding up in detention. You know, this presidential administration, back to school 2017 said, we're gonna get rid of DACA, right? And it's still kind of hanging, you know, the Supreme Court overturned the challenge, but did it administratively. So there, there, there still is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, frisson and uncertainty around DACA. And my actual mother, who's actually here, said when Obama was first um, making the DACA program in response to the demands of dreamers, dreamer is another word in the book, we went to a forum in Kenosha that Bosa's De La Frontera had for people who wanted to sign up for DACA. And my mom like elbowed me in the, in the side and said, if they put their names on that list, the government has their names, right? And now we're figuring out, oh shit, the government has their names. Like if, if you have DACA, which protects you, the government has your name. And just as when freed people were living peacefully, and some of you saw the movie 12 Years a Slave, if, if you were never enslaved, or if you had been enslaved and you made it to Boston or Philadelphia and you were having a life, and a slave catcher showed up and said you were someone, even if you weren't that someone, all of your security, your whole life went out the window. It's that way for our, our DACA students, it's that way for our undocumented neighbors right now. I mean, how many times last fall, there was a, a raid here where they, um, there was a family taking their kids to school, it was a husband and, and wife and their three daughters who were teenagers and pre-teenagers and ICE pulled up, blocked their car in concert with the Milwaukee Police Department, reached in and pulled the father out and detained him. And there was a popular outcry. Lauren, you and I went to some of those protests and eventually that, that family got up. But that means that family with the undocumented father and the US born kids and the, the wife, the, the woman who was indigenous actually, she was Oneida, that family every single day that could happen, right? So it was really important for me to have that reach back to fugitive, for example. And as I talk, I'm like coming on words, like dreamer is an important word in the book. Um, immigrant and migrant, because I think I often find that my students are really confused. You know, what's an immigrant, what's a migrant? Because, because the political, sort of ferment, the yeasty, horrible political ferment about these makes it really unclear what they are, makes some of them bad words. Literally, I've had students in my Ethnic 101 transnational migrations class who think of refugees as a bad word. Like it's, it's not something nice you say about someone, right? <laughs> you know, wow. Thank you, that's great. Um, Jamie Daniel has a question. Could you talk about the gender slash anti-LGBT agenda that is used to deny refuge? My son worked with trans women trying to escape anti-trans violence in Colombia and they were all denied and one killed when sent back. Yeah, I was pretty impressed by the visibility of trans people in Tijuana. There are, there is one particular detention center in New Mexico that has unit of trans folks. So some folks have been able to cross, but Alejandra, maybe you can address this too in terms of just discrimination in terms of entering. Yeah, so as the thing about entering and about getting processed is that in as much as there are policies and laws governing it, there's, it also comes down a lot to like the individual discretion of whatever border officer you get, like you are still, 
subject to like the individual vagaries and prejudices of like the person that you are interacting with who could be like, actually, you're violating this law. And even though there's nothing immediately apparent about that. And so there's that. You were referring to the transpod at Siebel, which actually has been shut down to, to lack of appropriate medical care. Um, and those women have mostly been sent like different places all over the country. A lot of them are, are, are in Colorado now. Um, but I think that part of it is also like judges don't necessarily understand all the time what transness is or what it means. And so, for example, if someone goes through childhood presenting as a different gender, and then once they reach adulthood, they're like, actually, I am a different gender than throughout my life, those, that difference could be seen as a reason to deny asylum or as a kind of, oh, you're clearly faking it kind of a thing. And so it also really rests on like this really misunderstood definition of what gender is and what transness is and what transness can look like and what survival strategies in a deeply transphobic society can look like for individuals who are just like trying to get through and trying to get out before like their full gender expression is allowed to exist basically. So Kristen Pitt has a related question I think which is more about, Rachel, your strategy for, for talking about gender in the book. Um, so maybe you can return to that a little bit. She's wondering um, if you could talk about your strategies for talking about gender and sexuality throughout the book, including the fact that there aren't separate entries that are obviously about gender or about sexuality in this, like, I presume they're not cordoned off in that way, so. Yeah, I do tell a story about the Cibola pod in the book, but there aren't words that are specifically gendered under the entries. I do tell stories about gender and sexuality. Each entry, for those of you who haven't read it, starts with a story and then goes into a short analysis of the words indicated by that story. Um, I guess I thought it was important to deal with the violence particularly against trans folks, which is common on both sides of the border and particularly in detention facilities. Um, certainly trans people are really vulnerable in detention. And also it's really important to say that the folks who aren't crossing aren't in motels, right? They're in tent cities, they're in shelters. Um, the shelters I saw in Tijuana are, you know, bunk beds crammed into a church they're really COVID cluster potential bearing places. All of this to say, Kristen, I didn't think about organizing it in terms of gender very carefully. I thought of it in terms of representing struggles about gender and sexuality more. Okay, Hugo Lungback has a question. Um, he says, you already talked a bit about wanting to write an accessible book, mm -hmm. accessible. Um, at the beginning, but could you talk a bit more about connecting the humanities, scholarship, and activism, which I would just say something that you, of many folks I know at UWM, do particularly well. Thank you, Hugo. I'm glad that you came today, and thanks for that good question. Um, yeah, I think for a long time, I thought that I just had to do everything all the time and not connect them. Um, and I guess my book before I wrote this book was about um, the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born, who were these really great, badass immigrant rights activists in the mid 20th century. And um, I wrote that book partly because they felt like home to me when I found their archive. I, um, I had not had this experience. I think a lot of people who become historians have this experience of um, feeling like they have, I don't know, I call it historical crushes, right? Like there are people in the past who get them but I, I had that experience in the archive and I just, you know, but that book was really for me, that's a hard book to read, even though I wrote it thinking about the immigrant white rights work I, did, I do here. I've been working with Voces de la Frontera since I moved here in 2004. And because I'm me, you know, I'd be at a march with, you know, 20,000 people and I'd be like, has anyone done this before? Like, where'd you guys get this idea? Is there a history of this? And, you know, that's really not how activists and organizers think at all. You know, they're like, wait, what are we gonna do next? And, you know, so 
that book answered that question and I really wanted it to be for that movement. I wanted to say, hey, you know, we've been here a lot. Like people think the immigrant rights movement began in 2006 and it's uh, Jim Sensenbrenner's responsibility for starting that horrible bill that would have criminalized um, aiding undocumented people. And, you know, we had Jim Sensenbrenner to think, no, we had the American Committee for the Protection of the Foreign Born and we had heroic activists in Los Angeles and New York and and El Paso who like fought against having their neighbors and their friends and their families deported. That's the history. It was a love letter to that movement, which I've been involved with my whole experience in Milwaukee, but that movement really couldn't hear that love letter, which is really sad if you write a love letter and it's unreceived. You know, like, I mean, it's bad enough we're gonna lose the postal service, but you know, marked unread. Um, so I really had to rethink it. And I think, you know, I, I'm not sorry I wrote against the deportation terror. That's a story that needed to be told that had not been told because of really crazy red baiting reasons that really infest still the historical profession. So I'm happy that that book is there, but I wanted people who were doing the work to be able to use what I was saying and they couldn't use against the deportation terror. Like sometimes they'll humor me and I'll speak and they'll be like, yeah, that's great. That's cool. Good to know. But like it, it isn't useful to them. I wanted this to be useful to activists and teachers and immigrants and like this is this is where we stand and you know I did always I do have this other writing career which I've thought of my entire time as a professor as my real my parentheses real writing career and so I guess you could say that this book is my coming out like this is this is how I want to talk this is how I've been talking I can talk that other language it's fine I can read that other language I learned from that other language reading Libby's piece which is is very academic but incredibly beautiful about these aid workers and refugees in post-war Europe is, is incredibly moving and I'm, I'm really happy that I can travel in that world. But I want my work to have some traction in this world and it kind of didn't with the second book. That's such an important story. I love that story. I love those people. I want everyone to know about them. But, and so some of those stories about the American Committee from my second book, I wrote about in the third book. Cause I was like, I don't think you got that. <laughs> like it's really important that Ira Golubin, you know, worked for immigrant rights for 75 years, a 75 year long legal career. It's really important. And it's really important that he was like the first generation Jewish American communist and that, you know, Abner Green worked in a water, waterfront pharmacy as a, as a young working class kid and heard all these stories of sailors about their problems with naturalization and became an immigrant. Those are really important stories to me, but I had to make them important to other people. So, um, we have one question from Mill Blewett, Milwaukee Blewett, I presume. Um, there's also a lovely one from Kum Kum, but Blewett's question I think is thematically related to this. So I'm going to ask this one next and maybe combine it also with a question from Deborah Wilk. I'm getting really fancy here in my moderating. But Blewett asks, what would you hope that student or general readers might take away from reading your book? Which is, I think, related to what you're talking about. Have you thought about strategies that instructors or book group leaders might use to lead discussions of the book and as you were talking I was even thinking like you could hand it out to people at, when you're at Tijuana um, at the border and then Deborah Wilk asks to both of you are there any words either of you think should be added in the wake of pandemic and protest both of which happened after your book went to press right um so I'll take part of Peter's question first and then try and move to Deborah's. And Alejandra, maybe you want to answer too. Um, I mean, one thing I say in the book is everyone I talked to when I was writing this book, everyone I talked to was like, how come you're not covering this word? And how come not that word? And, you know, so I would have your students look in the table of contents and complain about what's not there to start. You know, cause like, just like, there's a lot of stuff I don't cover. There's only 33 words, even more than alphabet letters, but still not enough, right? I would also say that what I hope to get at, that people get out of this book, this regime works by muddying the waters and confusing people. So like the kid who came into my Ethnic 102 class in 2015, it was before the election, and was like really using refugee as a curse word. You know, he didn't like have some like change of heart in the class. But he did meet a lot of foreign born kids that talked about learning English from the TV. And then he did learn the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker and an immigrant. So 
Peter, you're a poet, right? You know that words matter. And I think it's so hard to understand what's going on in our world. And these people who run our country now, they work by exploiting fear and muddying the waters. You know, they demean language. So this book is to re-mean language. And I totally forget Deborah's question because I was focusing on the, on the word thing, I'm sorry. It was about the pandemic and the protests. Oh yeah. Uh, Hendra, I'll let you start with that. I have things to say too, but I know you've been doing the work on this. Yeah, I think I really have trouble thinking about like specific words, but I think I don't think colonialism is in here. And that feels like a really important word when we are talking about histories of migration and like US intervention. And these are things that you talk about in the book a lot. But I think seeing the ways in which the United and understanding especially the United States as a colonizer and a colonizing force feels like such an important way of being like, these are not necessarily like completely foreign refugees who are showing up on our doorstep because we're rich and they want to be like us. Like these are people that we have displaced that our policies, that US policies have like done damage to. And I think having that be like its own little section in the book. Um, and that seems especially obvious in the wake of, of the pandemic, I think, because of the ways that we have literally been exporting the disease to countries like Honduras and Guatemala through deportations and through literally ICE agents lying about the condition of people that they are putting on the planes to deport back to these countries. Like we are exporting disease and we feel like we have a right to do that because we're a colonial power. Yeah, and to pick up on that, I mean, if I was gonna write a book, this book now, maybe, I mean, I'm so struck by the term essential worker, right? You know, in Wisconsin, the big COVID clusters have happened in immigrant communities in Green Bay. There's been one in Franklin, um, you know, and it's all about capitalism, right? Like companies that don't want to pay for PPE or social distancing or force employees to come to work when they're sick and then won't give them health coverage when they get sick. People have died here for those reasons. And I'm, I'm so struck by those thank you essential worker signs. They make me, they make me really anxious and give me a stomach ache because we're, we're talking about who has to be, well, my friend Christine, Christina Heatherton, as happens, had a great thing on Facebook, like stop calling hostages heroes, right? The people who are essential workers, the people who are doing that work are in a particular socio-political situation, which really relates to what Alejandro was saying. Often I get asked when I speak in churches and other places like, well, how can we keep accepting them from the rest of the world? And I try to say gently, we could stop messing up their countries and then there would be fewer of them. Like it's, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. It's really like, you know, don't be, don't be supporting terror and death and exploitation globally and fewer, most people, again, and I, I just don't think Americans understand this, most people are like you are and don't wanna leave your home. Most people love their homes. Nobody leaves lightly. Nobody wants to leave, you know? And so we have to understand that the people we talked at the border, both times I was there about trauma-informed interviewing, because if, if people didn't leave their home countries because of trauma, and most of them did, there was trauma along the way, or there was trauma when they're there, right? You know, these are not light stories. And it's really important, I think, for a lot of us, for all of us, uh, people whose ancestries are from anywhere else besides the US, people whose ancestors were bought, brought here enslaved, people who are indigenous but were forced to move as their homelands kept, get, kept shrinking, those stories in our families are always difficult stories, right? They're always stories that are about depression and melancholy and pain. This is a human thing. Thank you. We have another question from Kumkum, our colleague in English. And she says, this is such an important project. I'm interested in the links you make between internal displacement and the denigration of those who flee from it, a sort of double denigration where one feeds the other. Could you talk more about this? 
Yeah, I think that's really important, Kum Kum, thank you. When we go back to Madalena's question about, I think it was your question about climate refugees, most people move internally first, right? So if the gang is threatening your family in rural Honduras, you move to Tegucigalpa hoping that they won't find you, right? And there are some agencies that track those kind of internal migrations. If your land no longer yields food, if your village is flooded, if it's too dangerous because of the civil war or because of the petroleum companies in, in your country, whatever it is, you move internally first. You go shelter with relatives. You go where somebody speaks your language. And I think it's really important. That's why the term migrant was really important to me. Because I've always thought that if you look at, for example, the great migration of African Americans in this country, it was our colleague Rob Smith, when he was a grad student, who said in a class with me, like, you know, that's a freedom struggle. That's a freedom movement is moving. Like saying, I'm not staying in the South anymore. And in fact, to deliver the Chicago Defender to small Southern towns was risking your life. You know, the, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, they did that work and they did it at great cost because it was illegal to distribute a Chicago paper where black churches were saying, you know, if you come here, you'll be safe. We'll take care of you, right? So that's a really important example of internal displacement because of terror, right? And it's not tracked. And this is, you know, this is a, also a disciplinary point, I think, because immigration studies is, doesn't think about internal migration. So indigenous people fall off the map, internal migrations fall off the map, climate migrations fall off the map because people move locally first and sometimes succeed in staying there sometimes for a couple of generations, right? And I, I really felt like we needed a conceptual map that showed us that, you know, particularly in the history of North America, but I think globally we're in motion were, you know, for lots of reasons. And, you know, crossing borders is just one piece of this. So I think now I will ask my question. Um, and if there are others, please feel free to lob on. But um, I'm wondering actually if both of you, if you can tell us a little bit, or if you have any prognostications or um, expectations about what will happen in the wake of the 2020 election, we don't know what's gonna happen, right? But, but um, it's possible that we will have a new administration. But what I'm curious about is, I mean, I haven't read the book yet, you seem, but just from knowing you and having conversations with you, this regime change in the kind of the language of how we talk about asylum seeking did not, the transformation has been, or the, I, maybe the dismantling has been long coming and did not and preceded the Trump administration and I would guess would likely continue after the Trump administration but I'm wondering if you know whether the Biden campaign has any particular platforms on this issue is there any like nugget of of hope there with where they've promised to kind of protect dreamers or other or kind of remantle if we can use that word from dismantle some of the things that have been taken apart I mean, the Biden campaign is not explicitly xenophobic, right? So the, the ex acceleration of the dismantling, the, the xenophobic hatred is specific to this regime. What's not specific to this regime is the um, for-profit detentions, which begin actually under Reagan. So Carter passes under Carter, the 1980 refugee law, which brings us into international compliance passes. And then <laughs> Poor Ronald Reagan. Then the Haitian boat crisis happens and Ronald Reagan has his boys digging in the in the National Archive. Like, how can we not have all these black people come here under the we just passed this humanitarian thing. And, and now there's all these black people washing up on shore. And first they invent interdiction. So the, the Coast Guard sweeps people up and dumps them back in Port-au-Prince, regardless of them saying, you know, they're going to kill me in Port-au-Prince. They get they get dumped back and people keep coming. They keep coming. And that's really important because that's agency and that's a freedom struggle. And when they wind up in Florida, the Reagan administration is like, hey, we'll throw them in jail, right? Nothing in the international refugee regime said that was a good idea, but they're just throwing them, they're repurposing like Chrome Avenue detention, which is now a detention facility, was just a sort of jail that dated, I think back from the Confederacy. I know there were snakes. This is important to me. I'm really afraid of snakes, but my friend Carl Linskoog, who wrote a really great book on this is like, you know, they, 
at the beginning, they didn't even have facilities. They just put the Haitians into, into Chrome Avenue and like let the snakes take care of them. But gradually, they start contracting out to these private corporations that now donate massively to Republicans and Democrats. So that's why, you know, people often say, well, you know, this, you know, Trump says, well, this started with Obama. It didn't start with Obama. It's much older than that. Xenophobia is much older than that. But that's older. But I do think with the Biden campaign or any, anyone, um, any Democrat, you know, Obama did not invent DACA. Dreamers invented DACA. Obama managed to hear them over the din of other things. So if you have a less brutal regime that can attend these different frequencies, you know, DACA is better than nothing, but it kind of sucks, right? It's saying like, well, the young people are blameless, but everyone else in their community are evil people that should remain undocumented and have no rights. But, you know, very specifically, the dreamers advocated for DACA as a strategy, as a foothold towards something else, right? And if you have a different regime that can hear that, I think there is hope, actually. I'll take it. Um, as we wrap up, can you tell people where they can find your book? I know in early stages in, your fellow, in our fellow seminars, you had said, I want this to be an Urban Outfitters. I wish it was at Urban Outfitters. Can we find it there? Where can we buy it? Uh, not yet in Urban Outfitters that I know of. Um, yeah, that was my kids. They were like, mom, it'll be like for, the, for your woke shoppers in Urban Outfitters in the checkout lane where the cool last minute purchases are, which I still envision, but I'm not sure that Fordham has managed to do that. You can get it at 20% discount from Fordham University Press. You can come to our event at Boswell's on September 3rd at seven o'clock and buy it at Boswell's. Boswell, or not come to, sorry, it's virtual. But Boswell's is doing, you can pick up books, you can order it through them, and I think it's still a 20% discount. If you're using it for a class or for a group, there's a 15% discount if you're ordering more than 10 copies. So I can, you can get a hold of me and I can get you to the right person who can get you to that discount. So those of you who are teaching it, and thank you, Peter and Kristen, I know you both are, um, you can get a discount that way. Um, you can get it on Amazon, but don't, because they suck. Um, you can get it from an indie bookseller. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. This was really lovely and energizing. I really appreciate it. Richard, if you have anything, last words, now's the time. Otherwise, we'll all sign off. I uh, just want to thank everybody for coming and especially thank Rachel and Alejandra for their participation. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's great. It was our pleasure. Good Bye, everyone. All these different people in the same place. Well. Mm -hmm.